And then tonight we have a testimony, and I would like to introduce Samantha to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm glad all of you came tonight. So my name is Samantha, and I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to be here at Valley Real Life to share my story with you guys. I want to start off with a prayer really quick because I could use the God's guidance. So let's pray. Goodness. All right. Father God, Lord, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for each person in this room tonight. Father God, I pray that my story would touch someone's heart or if not in everybody's heart, Father God. And I pray that you would give me peace that you would speak through me tonight, Lord. Let my words be yours because my story is written by you, Lord. And I thank you so much in advance for what you're gonna do tonight in everyone's hearts. In your name we pray, amen. amen. All right, so I wanna start off with a newspaper article from the Spokesman Review. This is dated back from November 10th of 1995. Murder-suicide adds the city's toll of domestic violence leaving two dead in Spokane's most homicidal year. Another case of domestic violence explodes into murder-suicide Thursday, making this the worst year for murder in Spokane history. A 33-year-old man shot and killed his girlfriend outside their North Spokane home while she held their daughter before taking his own life. The shooting happened in the 1400 block of West Dalton, bringing the numbers of murders committed in Spokane that year to 20. Nearly half of the recorded numbers of killings have been blamed on a domestic violence, police said. Relatives and neighbors identified the latest murder victim as Denise Chapman, age 30. She was shot in the head by a man identified as Dan Foote, who then shot himself in the head. They both died at the scene. The toddler was not injured. About 1.30 p.m., witnesses saw Foote, a mechanic, pull into the front of his mother's house, which is directly behind the Dalton Avenue home, which he rented with Chapman. He lifted the rifle out of his trunk, walked between the two houses into his backyard, neighbors said. One, one shot rang out, followed a few seconds later by another. We called 911, went over there, and saw her lying there, said Cody Jones, who was on a nearby front porch with friends. Their baby was with her, but she wasn't crying. Chapman lay there in a driveway with her hair matted in blood and her arms draped across their daughter. Police at first thought the woman was still alive, but paramedics concluded that she was dead. A hunting rifle was found near Foote's body in the backyard. Foot his mother, Anne, ran into the yard, picked up the child, yelling to the neighbors, he shot them all, said Cherry Ray, who lived across the street on Dalton. The baby was just full of blood, said Ray, who had been friends with Anne for 20 years. I tried to wash it off with, so with soapy water, but I could not pry her hands loose. I could not get Anne to loosen her grip on the baby. Relatives and neighbors said they had no idea what led to the shootings. And I was that little girl, um, I was two years old when this happened. Um, I and my um, siblings were victims of our circumstances. We had no control over what happened um, to our mom and my dad and what my dad chose to do. Um, this led me to being confused growing up. Um, I lived with my grandma for about the first five years of my life, and then I moved in with my aunt and uncle, who then became my mom and dad. I grew up calling them my mom and dad, and my cousins, my sisters, and you could see where the confusion would start to come in. And because of the confusion and the questions left unanswered, and as I got older, my, uh, my behavior started to change, I became, uh, just an angry child. I was stealing things, skipping class, hiding my homework, uh, you name it, I probably did it. So this led to uh, some behavioral issues which led to me by age 11 uh, smoking cigarettes, age 12 losing my virginity and smoking pot by age 13, drinking for my first time and moving out of uh, such an amazing home. 
and amazing people who loved me and cared for me, I broke their hearts. To me, it was, the rules didn't matter to me at that time. It was just what felt good, I needed that. And as addicts, we understand that. It's like, okay, this feels good and I'm gonna run after it. It's not always good for us, right? So I, this led, so when I moved out at 13 years old, I moved in with my sister and I knew that I would have the lack of rules. I would still have some rules, but I could do what I wanted. And my sister wanted me in her life at the time, so she was like, yeah, I'll come pick you up. So when I moved there, I didn't know that I was opening, to the, opening the, road to, the door to the road of destruction in my life. I didn't know that smoking weed and drinking would lead to many different relationships and eventually using meth myself and um, becoming homeless and so on. So I had a, a broken heart which led to being in relationships. So I was in several different relationships. I'd say probably before I used meth, I was in two or three relationships because I needed to fill a hole in my heart. And I was filling it with all the wrong things. So when I lived at my sister's, I, was, I had free reign to do whatever I wanted to do pretty much. I skipped school. Uh, she would call me, call the school and say I was sick so I could stay home and smoke pot and hang out with my friends, whatever it was. And by uh, probably about a year after this, I, she got into her addiction. I moved in with my brother and I, again, into an er another relationship. And it didn't take very long after this relationship for me to get into another relationship because that I'm just broken, and I think that I just need a man to fill me. Um, and so in this uh, second relationship I'm in, I'm living at my brother's probably a month, and then I move, move out of his house into um, the boyfriend's house. And as soon as I moved in with this guy, he became abusive towards me. He was jealous, uh, I couldn't do anything without him being insecure or wondering what I'm doing or, or anything like that. It, it was just out of control. And I didn't know why, I'm like, I'm not doing anything wrong. Why are you being like this towards me? And it took me pro probably a month to figure out why he was like that. I caught him smoking meth down in the basement. And I'm like, oh, okay, so this is why you're treating me like this. It's, is you're being secretive, and so you think I'm being secretive. So I, in my head, I'm like, okay, if I can't beat them, I'll join them. So I decided to try meth for my first time that night. And I wish I didn't, but I did. And so it wasn't even a month after that we were homeless, um, living in the car in his backyard because we were kicked out of his house. And then we were couch hopping, um, and you know what goes on from there. Um, I could go into details, but the details don't matter. And um, the most important part of my story is what God has done in my life. So I kind of want to fast forward a little bit. So God was really trying to get my attention several times in my addiction because there was a point in one of my other relationships where... Um, because one of the other relationships I was in, he was my drug dealer, so I was getting meth whenever I wanted, and I didn't have to pay for it, so I was using it all the time, every, all day, every day. And I used so much that it got into my head, and I had drug-induced schizophrenia, which caused me to just think all the most craziest things. If you experience that, you kind of know what I'm talking about. It's different for everybody. For me, Satan was in my head big time. Um, it, like semi trucks driving by with females screaming bloody murder um, in the wind, you better hide, I'm gonna find you, you better hide. Just that craziness in my head that I was hearing. I'd be running down the street at two o'clock in the morning thinking there's someone in a car following me. There probably wasn't. <laughs> you know, it's just, but that was my reality. And it was scary, and I lived in fear for many years. And so those were times when God was trying to get my attention. And 
during this time that he, he was like, okay, you're done. You need to figure it out. Um, I was staying at a house that had got raided and, and uh, the, so there's the Spokane or the Lincoln County Police Department that raided the outside of the house and then we were threatened with the Spokane County Police Department to raid the inside of the house and we were told if you want to go to jail you can stay here if you want but I mean if you don't want to go I, I suggest you leave. So this was the first time in the, let's see, four, four or five years of my addiction that I had no one to lead, lean on. Doors were closed and God was making those things happen. And, but I didn't know that. I'm like, I got nobody. I got nowhere to stay. What am I supposed to do? So um, I didn't mention earlier, but I had went to detox three, three or four different times because all these different times I wanted to go to detox, I was really wanting to be done because the voices were so loud in my head, I just wanted to be done. But I was doing it without God, so I couldn't be done. There was an anxiety within me that said, you're, you're not done yet. So I would last maybe 30 days outside of detox and then relapse each time. And then this last time when the house got raided, I went to detox again and I got left in the sobering unit for about three days because they left, lost my paperwork. I had to wait for them, finally went upstairs, and they wanted me to go to some adept thing, and I'm like, I'm not going to that. You can let me sleep in a comfy bed. I've been sleeping on a mat on the tile floor for three days, <laughs> and that, so I went off and I left. And I used one last time, and this was February of two, 2013. It took me about two weeks until um, the place I was staying at said they were sick and tired of me staying on the couch and I needed to go to the shelter. <laughs> so God was like, okay, now I got you. Hook, line, and sinker, I got you. So when I, this was, um, I was encouraged to go to the Union Gospel Mission Crisis Shelter when it was back on Sprague. And I had, um, I didn't wanna go there, but I did. And I walked into the back doors, and before anyone had even said a word to me, I had an overwhelming sense of peace and hope, and just like the Holy Spirit was there. I didn't really know much about the Holy Spirit, but it had to have been the Holy Spirit. So in Acts 26, 18, it says, to open their eyes so that they may turn from the darkness to the light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and be placed among those who are sanctified by faith in me. My eyes began to open at the Union Gospel Mission Shelter. And I lived there for two months before I heard about the program at Ann Ogden Hall. And that program, changed my life. It really did. Um, and I know there's some ladies here who go there and you guys are awesome. And that program changed my life. I was very stubborn at first. And um, in that program, they tell you not to be in a relationship because it's a distraction. And if you want to change and you want to give your life to Jesus and, and do what you need to do, then you d need to remove anything that can keep your eyes off of Jesus. So it wasn't even about a month or two before I had my eyes on a guy. <laughs> at an, at a, I started going to a celebrate recovery while I was in program there, and my eyes went to a guy who is now my husband today, Nick. And <laughs> that's exciting. Yes, it is. Um, but during this time, I hid this relationship. Yes, I hid it, and I still allowed the world to um, put a shield over my eyes from what God was really wanting to do. And, um, and God was like, probably four or five months into it, God was like, you need to start living an honest program. And so he spoke through me to my counselor, and I told on myself. I showed a picture of me sitting on his lap during a dance, and she's like, who's this? And I'm like, okay, this is my boyfriend. <laughs> and so this, this is where it got hard for me because I was given an ultimatum to leave program and stay with him or stay in program and leave him. 
And I was angry. I'm like, who are you to tell me I can't be in a relationship? I mean, I'm doing what I need to do here. And she's like, if you want to take this serious, then I, I suggest you do what's right. And he actually, Nick, encouraged me to stay in program. I was all ready to leave. I was like, yeah, I'm going to pack my bags, call my aunt, get you got a room for me. I was all ready to leave. But because of his encouragement and him letting me know that if, if God wants us to be, get, be together, that he'll still be here. And so I spent three months on a very extensive um, plan not to talk to him or have any contact with him for those three months. And um, God did some amazing things. Just three months, you think, is a short time. But for me, it, a lot happened in three months. Um, Ephesians 3, or Ephesians 5, 8 says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are a light in the Lord. Walk as children in the, uh, of the light. So if, if I wanted to really be who God wanted me to be, I needed to, to re- erase any darkness, any darkness that had any type of power over me. And that was one thing as being dishonest is I needed to give that to God and start living in an, an honest program. In First Peter 1 Peter 1.13, it says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded and set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Christ Jesus. In recovery, I have learned that keeping my mind focused on what God wants for me and what Jesus has planned for me has done amazing things. I'm not perfect. I struggle. I give into worry on a constant. I overlook and overthink and um, think on one thing too much, and then it controls my mind. I am not a perfect Christian, but God's working on me on a daily basis, and because I did what I needed to do in that program, and I stayed in program, and I didn't leave and be with him, because if I did that, I probably wouldn't be here on the stage today. I wouldn't be a part of Celebrate Recovery. I wouldn't um, probably be in recovery. I probably would have relapsed probably time and time again, Um, but that wasn't part of God's plan for my life. I, um, just this past month, I celebrated nine years of recovery. And so much has happened in nine years. So much has happened in nine years. God's plan for me and my husband was ministry. Um, the previous church that we went to, he was associate pastor at, and he, we, we did things together. We went to um, ABHS treatment facility and brought church out there to the ladies. I did that for about five, six years, or I don't even know, probably longer than that. And that was a major blessing, and I loved sharing the love of Christ and the light of Christ with those ladies because they came out of the darkness. They came out of addiction, prison. They came out of being fresh on the streets, trying to figure out what they wanted to do in their lives, and I got to go there and and be a hope for them. And my husband, the same, got to go on the men's side and do the exact same thing, and today, And within this last year, God has blessed us to be able to uh, be leaders of our own Celebrate Recovery out in Nine Mile Falls, Washington. So that is huge. That is, that wasn't even a part of our plan, but that was a part of God's plan because we moved out there and we were looking around for a church and and we were asking around if there was a Celebrate Recovery out there and the church we go to, they said, um, no, but we're praying that someone would come along with the knowledge and knows about Celebrate Recovery. And we just happened to have come from one and looking for one and it just kind of got put together like that. Absolutely amazing. We also uh, struggled to get pregnant for since we since we've been married, um, which is uh, going on seven years this June. But the past six years, we really worked on um, having a child, and God finally blessed us this past July with our baby girl Graceland, who's eight months old today, and she has turned me into a whole different woman. I see things differently. I love differently. I've wanted to be a mom for so many years, and it makes me view life differently. It makes me view the love God has for us 
Like, it's got to be so similar, so similar, because it's like, I'd do anything for that little girl. I mean, I spoil her. She's amazing. So God can turn your mess into a message. I want to encourage you guys. Each of you has a story, and God is continuing to write mine as he's continuing to write each and every one of your stories. And if he gives you an opportunity to share that, let him, because you and I might just be the only Bible someone might read. The world's only getting darker out there, and we need to be the light. You know, it takes just a little bit of light to illuminate, illuminate a room. Woo. This room right here, it's pretty bright yeah. because of you guys. Romans 8.28 says, and we know for, that those, for those who love God, all things work together for good for, the, for those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. Amen. And I have a, a picture that's going to be up on the screen here. Oh, it's up on the screen right there. Um, so the darkness of addiction, that was me before my meth addiction. That was just smoking weed and drinking. And, and the darkness was just, it had already consumed me before I even got into my meth addiction. I didn't even think it was that bad because I was in the world and I knew nothing of the light of Christ. And today, my family, you could just see. You can just see it. it I don't even have to tell you guys. You can just see um, just how bright Christ's light is on us. And I just want to thank you guys for coming tonight. I know a lot of you, this is your home church, and I love that you guys come here. And There's new people here, and I thank you guys for coming here and choosing Celebrate Recovery because this is now your forever home. Celebrate Recovery doesn't matter if it's here, anywhere in Spokane, Nine Mile. We're all family. Amen. Amen. And so I just want to close with prayer. Really quick, Father God, Lord, thank you so much for allowing me to share your your story that you're writing in me, Lord, and you're continuing to write. I just lift up each man and each woman here in this room today, and I pray that you would give each of them an opportunity to share with somebody what you're doing in their life, Lord. Help each of us to be able to make this world a little bit brighter as the world's trying to be consumed with the darkness, Lord. We love you so much, and we thank you so much for what you're doing in each of our lives. In your name we pray, amen.